that is, uh, has been imposed into us in the middle of uh, perhaps the most contested election in the history of the United States, but most expensive one as far as we know from the engagement with the biggest participation ever, the biggest uh, male votes ever. And we are in the middle of it. We still do not know who uh, might uh, be declared president. It might actually happen in during this legal talk. Um, we do not know. Um, we have with us Andy Lerner, who is an actor in New York City. Just last night, she was with us for our uh, American premiere reading of Albert Camus' uh, Revolt in Asturias that went back to the beginning, the prequel, the prelude to the Spanish Civil Wars. On an election night, the play started, which he did at the White Box in Harlem um, as our contribution. There's something, uh, Camus' very first play in his workers' theater of his collaborators he wrote. It's a clearly political uh, work um, of a devastating uh, uh, revolt of miners. About 2,000 people died, uh, the foreign legion troops of the Spanish army was sent there. So um, that was a reminder of what can happen at election night. So uh, now it looks like uh, um, that what is close to the hearts of theater artists, the idea of change, of equality, of fairness, of access, uh, of inclusion, you know, might have been heard in America. We do not know yet. It's going back and forth, but signs are looking. Um, is something um, is changing and um, we keep you uh, posted. Andy, who is with us, will let us know in case any uh, announcement will be done so you can uh, stay with us um, in case you take this as a little break, a little oasis in the, in the day of an election that is historic, that is significant and that will change our lives and also for the life of this planet. I think we all think it is important. So many artists here on Siegel Talk said we wish we had a vote. We could also help to decide what happens in America because what happens here affects so many people and that idea of that shining place, you know, we all have to fight for, you know, it was or was in danger and still is. So artists have been on the right side of the struggle for freedom, on the right side, the struggle for justice on the right side for um, a change and um, in this complex struggle and, um, and art is a way to be part of it, to look at things, to have an arena where ideas can be fought out in some, with some rules. And, um, but it is something where you can look at many, many facets of a, uh, uh, of a situation. As Michael Frayn said when he came to the Siegel Center in a good play, everyone is right, um, but there is a bigger picture like this place we talked about so much here, the Brechts, uh, Galileo, the Antigone, you know, they teach us they are laws, but again, they govern humanity and uh, we have to be reminded of. And this is the work um, of artists. And with us today, um, we really do have um, two artists um, who um, have been uh, significant workers in the field of theater and the political. Um, they are part of um, what we would say the the, uh, the cornerstones of a, a New York um, city, uh, a vineyard of theater of the political for decades, uh, they have been uh, engaged uh, in using theater in uh, uh, in presenting work that challenges us, that thinks about to think about what we do in our lives, in families, in our cities, but also in our societies and in the world as me as living uh, uh, beings and humans and what meaning we have and should give to us with us is george Bateniev, who uh, began his professional acting career at the age of 14 in 1947 and he worked with the great great harold Klurman, who actually was a cuny professor at the time and of course of the, the group theater is a, such a significant uh, part of history and he's been working with karen malky who is here with us ever since and um, they founded the OB Winning Theater 3 Collaborative. It's a very long uh, a list of works um, they have done. George is mostly well known also for his work, I Will Bear Witness, The Holocaust Diaries of Victor Klemperer, a great professor of Romance languages who survived uh, as a Jewish professor at Germany, sometimes hidden, wrote diaries, they have been rediscovered. And George left as a young kid at Berlin in the Kurfürstenstrasse. Um, and went, had to flee with his family the day Victor Klemper started to write or the week his diary. So uh, it's quite a significant um, engagement. Uh, Karen Malpied produced her first play of 22 in 1974. She worked with the great, great Joseph uh, Chaikin, uh, who came up so often also in our talks um, here. And um, Judith Molina from the Living Theatre, a good friend of us also at the Siegel Theatre. We 
one of the plays where she went there when she was still out there in the actor's old age home. She often came up to us. And Judith Marina Dilek directed her, us, and, um, and uh, George Bateniev uh, started, starred in it, and they won an Obie. And she did so, so much. Um, um, the three collaborative uh, theater company, of course, a list of plays it's done everywhere. Theater for the New City, La Mama, New York Theater Workshop, Classic Stages, and also in London, Paris, Berlin, have they been done? They did a play, Anthology Blaze in Time, and um, she has been published by La Artist Press, the great La Artist Press, which we like very much, Applause and Rutledge, and uh, online the Kenyan Review. So uh, both of them um, have seen a lot uh, as a combined uh, experience of working in the theater um, spans, you know, over a century. So Karen and uh, uh, George, uh, welcome. First of all, it's a great honor to have you guys here. What a crazy day. How are you feeling? Were you up all night? Where are you? Thank you. Yes, Thank course. you, Frank. First yes. of all, thanks for having us. Go <laughs> Were we yeah. up all night? <laughs> yes, we couldn't help but be up all night. This is uh, the most important uh, election ever uh, in my lifetime uh, also. So, I mean, it's, it's incredible. And uh, it's a real cliffhanger. And and uh, it's going to affect everything we do and think for the next, uh, who knows. Uh, it depends on, on whether we survive uh, this, uh, depending on, on the outcome, which is like razor edge. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I think we're all waiting for that. I think, you know, I, I'm struck by all the commentators saying we have to count every vote. And of course we do have to count every vote, but then every vote goes into the electoral college, which is a slaver's uh, relic, right? If we were counting every vote, Joe Biden would be president right now. Um, Hillary Clinton would have been president. Al Gore would have been president um, and life would be presumably different. Um, the other thing that that's just politically that's been on my mind is that if we had a national health care, if if President Obama, when he had the Senate and the House, uh, had gone for national health, Medicare for all, instead of for uh, the Affordable Care Program, I don't think we'd be in this situation either. I think people would have experienced what democratic socialism can do for everyone, and it wouldn't be a scare word used to uh, turn the state of Florida, keep the state of Florida red, et cetera. So those are my quick political thoughts, but let's talk about theater also. Yeah. What our yeah, latest projects <laughs> you are. You can't separate the two, <laughs> but. No. Yeah, it goes no. like a horse and carriage. Um, it does go, yeah. it does go uh, yeah. together, but still, um, how, how do you look at this moment? Uh, if you go around the city of New York, your, your beloved city where you did most of your work, also in America, what, how, how do you feel in this country at the moment as artists? Well, you know, we live, on, we live in Brooklyn, the Republic of Brooklyn. And uh, in, when the Black Lives Matter movement started in July, uh, the protests came up to Cal Avenue, which is where we live, many of the Brooklyn protests, because there's a precinct at the end of our block. So we joined those protests immediately. And out of that, uh, I, out of that, and the COVID crisis, and uh, my reading of Euripides compulsively since this all started, um, I wrote a new play called Troy Two, which is one of the two plays that we are now working on. Um, and this will be an international collaboration with Avra Sipperdepulo, who you've had on the show. Mm -hmm. um, and, and she asked, actually asked me to write the play for a book that she's editing. Um, so Troy too uh, looks at um, the COVID crisis, the climate crisis, and the Black Lives Matter crisis in a poetic and, and wild, uh, wacky way, uh, many layered and many dimensional. Um, uh, and you always read a play in the moment it was written, and then you read it against the history of the moment that it's in. And although this play is very new, uh, the moment that it was written in in the summer is a bit different than this moment. And uh, this is a crisis moment of democracy. Um, will this country uh, end its democratic run, which I don't think it will and I hope it won't, but we're all sort of, uh, will it fall like Troy 
um, or will it reconstitute itself in some uh, more just, equitable way? So what do you guys think? What will happen? One doesn't predict the future, but uh, yeah. you, put, <laughs> you put the possibilities out. I yeah. mean, we are a transformational theater and we do work for positive change and we show yeah. how that happens in each play that we do, including yeah. Troy too. So yeah. George, George. And, and, and Karen always has a story that's totally from the audience uh, and, and, you know, from the audience and also uh, into the future of what could be instead of what is. And uh, that, that opens up peop people uh, to the situation and then they, uh, they really identify with the situation the way it is. I mean, that's one of the things that's so brilliant uh, in what Karen does with a story that becomes the society uh, is a reflection of what the society is going through. And uh, because she's a language uh, poet, uh, it, it heightens uh, the political aspect of it, you know, so it's, uh, we have to think of other people and what they do and what they want. And uh, that's, uh, that's what always people say after they see the plays. They say, oh, if only this country could really see this play, uh, you know, and, and uh, that, that, that's one of the great uh, benefits of, <laughs> that keeps you going because, I mean, that is the reason you do theater like this. Uh, because it, it, it reaches people in a much more visceral way. And, and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's really more thrilling uh, to me also, because I've been involved in political theater for most of my life. And uh, this is uh, the poet that uh, does this all the time. So I'm honored to be with uh, this playwright. Thank you. And I, I, with this actor, producer, director, but we, we talk a lot about lineage. We too speak a lot about lineage, not only, uh, I mean, Erwin Piscotter, who George's, George studied at his yeah. studio and met Judith Molina when he was a teenager, yeah. even a younger, and they were in a play together at Piscotter's studio. Uh, homage to Camus, by the way, um, we read the plague, the minute the plague, our pandemic started, we read it out loud to each other. I used to teach Camus uh, State of Siege, um, uh, great play. Um, but then uh, Joe Chaikin, who you mentioned, um, the, these uh, Judith and Julian Beck, of course, um, people we worked with and knew very well um, and who, who were the ground on which we stand of, of being a transformational theater. So I was thinking, preparing for this talk that years ago, I saw the open theater do a little play called The Eating of the Corpse, which was during the Vietnam War. And it was actors very uh, ag aggressively and very realistically eating the pieces of an actor who was uh, prone on a table, who was a, a, a Vietnam, soldier who had been killed in Vietnam and devouring the corpse. And, and just last week, uh, a Zoom reading of my play, uh, Dinner During Yemen, which was done in 2018 at the Signature Theater was redone. And that is a play about two American diplomats, two female American diplomats eating this elaborate dinner while they discuss the, the starvation in Yemen and the American policy of selling bonds to the Saudis. So those two play, <laughs> the open theater play from way back then and Dinner During Yemen kind of came together in my mind <laughs> as two plays about eating, <laughs> but uh, two plays about eating the world, we might say. Uh, yeah. So all of this heritage that we feel very fortunate to have lived through lives in us now as we go forward, as we do our work now. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, uh, let's go for a moment to Andy. Um, I sound like CNN now. Oh but, my God, um, something happened. <laughs> Andy, do we have an update? Yes, just as of five minutes ago, CNN has projected that Biden will win um, three of the four electoral votes. In 
So that isn't a flip from the 2016 election, but earlier on Trump was leading in both of the congressional districts in Maine and they have just projected that Biden will actually take three of the four. So that is our new four districts. In yeah. Maine. Okay. Yeah. Three of the four electoral votes. Yeah. yeah. While we while we talk, things are happening as actually always um, in the world. Even if we do theater, things happen and at the same time, and we are often not aware what really is happening. It's hidden from our eyes. I think that really what we're you know one of the things that we're all kind of in shock about is is how large the Trump vote is uh, in this election. I mean, it, it, with every virtually every public intellectual every artist, all the artists against Trump, all the groups I belong to, again, speaking against this president for a number of reasons, racism, climate change, the fate of the climate hangs in the balance and we are an eco theater. We've done many plays, all of our plays have an eco dimension for years and years. Um, uh, so climate, race, um, gender, uh, women's rights, all of this hangs in the balance. And with virtually, as I said, every public intellectual, every artist in the country uh, opposing the current president, to see such a huge vote, a uh, huge popular vote for him is, is after stunning. The way he, after it's, the way he handled that it, pandemic. Yes, and it's on top so of the pandemic, shocking it's, it's, that, it, you, you almost don't know yeah. where to put yeah. it in, in some ways, it's a cultural failure. It's it's a it's a, it's a um, educational failure, and and as I say, it's a failure of, of showing people what a democratic socialist country could be like. The example I'm using is national health, and I do think if we had national health, we wouldn't be in this position at all. The pandemic would yeah. be more managed. Um, and uh, Trump would not have ever even been elected in the first place, as much less being in this moment right now. Um, the, <laughs> the, yeah. George? Yeah, no, well, I mean, uh, I, I, I think, you know, uh, th there's a terrible tendency uh, because uh, uh, America, the population in America always wants moderation and uh, they don't want revolution. They don't want uh, that kind of change because they, they ran away from countries who were extreme in their uh, exercise of power and, and uh, over people. And so they want to be left alone most of the time. And so what is completely terrible is that when you have that kind of atmosphere, somebody can come in and look like a strong uh, leader and people project what they want onto him. And I think that's one of the tragedies of, of this election is that people uh, identify, they'd rather have what appears to be a strong leader than to have somebody uh, who is like a nice guy and uh, is, is nice on every issue. Uh, it doesn't work, you know. The Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks proved that. We, we, uh, uh, they all uh, succumbed to that. We did a play in 2011 that on the 10th anniversary of 9-11. We were in New York on 9-11. And I worked closely with survivors and witnesses of the 9-11 attacks. Um, but yeah. this was a play about the American torture program called Another Life in which there's a character Handel, who George played, who is who very much prefigured Donald Trump in, in the way that he acted both, well, towards everyone um, and, and uh, the way that he manipulated the language, uh, the way he used language to manipulate people. Um, and we used to say back then when we were doing this, this play and we were working with Every night we had somebody from the ACLU or the, or the Center for Human Rights or the, you know, we, had, we had the anti-torture people who were defending um, the Guantanamo uh, torture victims and other torture victims. And everybody said, if we do not prosecute the torturers, torture will come home to the United States. 
And when President Obama, I don't mean to pick on President Obama because he's actually in this in the scheme of things, <laughs> a bright light, but I will say when he said, um, uh, we have to look forward, not backwards. We all, we all just knew that torture would come home and we would see this kind of police brutality escalate because who are the, who, you know, this is a, this is a revolving door. You go over to Iraq and you torture in Abu Ghraib and you come home and where do you get a job? either as a prison guard or in a police department. So the, the torture training is, is cyclical. And if you don't prosecute torturers mm -hmm. and you don't say that torture is absolutely illegal and immoral, mm -hmm. you get it back, it comes back to you. And that's mm -hmm. what we've seen this summer with so many shootings and not just this summer, but this summer sort of, you know, most <laughs> closely. Um, yeah, but but uh, George played this character uh, who ends up putting his his trophy wife in a in a box, <laughs> in a, in a um, chained like a like a victim. Uh, he played Handel, uh, it really uh, manipulating the language in a way that that sounds very much like what we see now here now. Mm -hmm. So um, you have done really for for decades, half a century, both together a century of, of work. Does it work? Is theater in the way you do it? You write a play at home, I think, at a computer or your typewriter or most probably the computer writing, and then you rehearse it and you play, audience come. What is your experience? What have you learned? What have we learned? <laughs> uh, somebody wrote me today on Facebook because I had noted that we were going to do this talk and and she said uh everybody who's ever seen or read your play has never forgotten the experience um and i was very moved by that i i have heard from people 20 years later that they never forgot the play that they saw um that said we have a very small audience uh because of economic censorship um the kind of plays that are allowed in this country are not the kind of plays we normally do or ever do perhaps. And we're heavily economically censored and sometimes critically censored and sometimes outright censored, you know, um, where we're told it's too, our, our plays are too, uh, too provocative to ever be produced at X theater, even though it's a brilliant play. We've been told that it's a brilliant play, but I can't do it. Um, artistic, so artistic, artistic directors. Yeah, yes, it's, so, it's, a, it's so too there, risky. So there is a, yeah. a a great deal of censorship in the American theater, um, uh, and that you know, as there is in American life, and much of it comes down to the way we fund things, the way we fund everything, so that healthcare is censored and theater is censored. Um, so both things are true. We've learned that we have an enormous impact. The plays really speak to people. They stick with people for in, in the flesh, um, which is what I think art does. It, art should get inside you and art should show that you can change. It, it works its way inside you and suddenly you feel differently than you felt 10 minutes ago before you saw. And you're breathing together with an audience, much is said about mm -hmm. this, so you're in community, but you're also changing in your own private specific way. So we know our work has this kind of impact um, but we also struggle to uh, reach audiences. What have we learned about art? We try to make it better each time. We, each time we do it. Well, uh, we. And, I think. I think what we do is we try to challenge ourselves uh, into another level uh of uh, for, for, for instance uh, the the last play that we just uh, did at la mama uh uh is an is the first science fiction play that karen's ever written and uh it, it takes place in the future and 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 it's it was fantastic uh uh and and it, it was totally new a new form uh, uh and a new uh, new way of writing for her and that that's one of the marvelous things that that she's able to do she's able to uh, create a world and a language for that world and a, a whole 
um, you know, ethos for, for that world and mythology and so on. So that uh, it's a very complete kind of experience. We've also um, been lucky uh, in our collaborators, um, Sally Ann Parsons, who has done our costumes since we started and Tony Giovanetti, who's done our lighting since we started, Arthur Rosen, who's our composer, who's writing a score for the new play, which George will talk about the other new play, Troy Two and Blue Valiant. But these are people who we've worked with for, for years and, and who are, we're so in sync that we, we hardly ever have to talk. I mean, we, we communicate in a kind of subliminal way so that uh, George had to turn into an owl in Other Than We and Sally Ann had to make this costume, which would be an all, all vista costume change from, from a Noam Chomsky-esque character who's a friend of our theater and a personal friend of ours, um, in, in, from, from that character into an owl in front of the audience. And uh, she had no idea how she was gonna do this, nor did we, until about a week before we opened. We had a very short uh, tech a day and a half for tech, for tech something like that. Um, but you know the, the the trust that she would come through, that Tony would do the the perfect lighting. Uh, these this kind of these kind of collaborative, um, and that Arthur would write the the music that we needed. This this collaborative um, we call our theater theater three collaborative. Kathleen Shalfond is another person we've worked with a lot, and we'll I wrote Blue Valiant. The, new, the other new play for her and for George. I, I love to write for actors I know, especially when they're brilliant actors like those two. And I crafted the character of Hannah Doyle for Kathy. So I really built it on what I knew about her. She had been in my play Prophecy. She was in uh, the documentary I did about the invasion of Iraq. She was in uh, Dinner During Yemen at the Signature. So we've worked together, you know, for, for a decade too, George. And, and George and Kathy love to act together. So this is a great pleasure. There are three people in this play and a horse. The third, yeah. per, the third person is a, is a child, an immigrant child who's escaped from a detention center. Yeah. Um, and then the horse uh, who will be played yeah. by a musical score. I turn it over to you. Yeah. Well, you, <laughs> you I, say everything? I don't know, I don't know what else <laughs> I can say now, but it's a, it's a very unusual play also, but because it, again, it's, it's in a totally different universe. And it's, and it's the first play that Karen's uh, written that's uh, it's seemingly completely realistic and in in real time the play seems to go from one scene to the other just in one span uh, uh, and uh, it, it, it's quite marvelous uh, so and, and at the end of uh, uh, at the end of uh, also it is it's very very it's very unusual. I can't. I can't really describe how the ending works, but it does. It, it's. It's. It's a different kind of ending, totally. Uh, but totally in keeping with the style of the play, and 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 uh, and it's all about uh, really healing. Mm -hmm. uh, the healing of an animal that is as complex as any human. And uh, uh, the the same issues of uh, healing and trauma, and, and and what does it mean uh, really to try to heal uh, an animal that you know you cannot communicate with? How to communicate with an animal? Uh, it, it's it's a, it's extraordinary. So uh, we're very excited about that. And we're going that to do way. Blue Valley. And we're going to do it. We're going to do it outdoors uh, at a rescue farm uh, 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 no, for animals for 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 horses in particular. Isn't it? No, it's actually this is an eco farm. Oh, where we're going to do it. We hope to do it at a rescue farm. But the first date we have is uh -huh. at Farm Arts <laughs> Collective in Pennsylvania in May. We'll do it outside in May. But I've written a lot about animals, actually. I, I grew up on horses. Uh, I was a horsewoman um, and would like to be again someday. Um, 
uh, and I ride whenever I get a chance to ride. Um, but the second play we ever did together uh, was a play called Better People, which was about genetic engineering. It's kind of mad satire on uh, genetic engineering. And in it, a very rare beast walks into George's lab and swallows him. Um, uh, the beast says one word, and this was a puppet made by Basil Twist. It was one of Basil Twist's first uh, New, New, York, York, yeah. New York gigs. Um, this yeah. beautiful big yak, anyway, uh, who has speaks one word, rendezvous. Um, and the, anyway, there's that play. And then of course, extreme weather, a frog, Sniffly is, is one of the central characters in extreme weather. And in Blue Valiant, the horse, Blue Valiant is a central character. Blue Valiant, I wrote before the pandemic, um, but it's a play about grief and healing and healing from grief. So in a way it sits uh, strangely in this, this moment as being a play that, you know, speaks to so many people, unfortunately, as, as we grieve the loss of so many people we knew and, and uh, don't know, but know are being lost. Um, yeah, so, so this, this uh, you don't think of theater necessarily as a place for animals, but indeed, indeed <laughs> <laughs> we are also yeah. animals. And, and, in, and in Other Than We, George turns into an owl, and the, the creatures who are created in Other Than We, the futuristic play, who have their, most importantly, have their heads connected to their hearts, which I think is something we need to redo so we have this connection so we can't act without feeling what we're doing and we can't feel without thinking about what we're feeling this this connection um the 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 notion of other than we is that empathy which is a an evolutionary trait learned by hunters and gatherers passing around babies because everybody had to be held and passed and cared for that that empathy can disappear because it is an evolutionary trait, right? And this notion struck me powerfully. If empathy can disappear, which I think it might be doing in our current world, then we have to reinvent empathy. We have to re-up our commitment to this head-heart connection and this way too. So we're connected that way <laughs> to others as well. Yeah. Many, uh, many artists, also we talk to in Siegel Talks, uh, um, talk, tell us about the importance we have to pay to the world of animals, the world of plants, mm -hmm. that this human-centric world has come to an end. Not only are we perhaps threatened as a species now, um, just as a mind game, if there's no vaccine for this virus, you know, we might not survive. Mankind might not survive. And there is these books out like Requiem. For a species that was, has never been as serious as it is now, um, if global temperatures go up, as we all know, you are in a hospital and you have high fever, uh, one degree more will kill the patient. The same will be with the earth. So the idea to put plants, the critical zone, the 30 feet above us and below us into the center is of significance, especially animals. Yes, uh, yes, absolutely. Yes, that's partly what other than we uh, is about, uh, because it's uh, it, it's about a, a inventing a new creature that is wiser and smarter than we are. So we're, it's not dominated by fear the way we are. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the, that's one of the wonderful things about the, uh, other than we, it always has some kind of central theme. Uh, it has a way of uh, taking the central theme and the story and, and putting them together so that they're one experience of that idea. It's, it's very yeah. good, yeah. So, um... Tell us a bit about the way you work, also dramaturgically. We're going to have next week, we have, we talk about theater of the real, uh, the documentary theater. We have Carol Merton with us. You work as writers and with sound music and with set design costumes. So let's say you have a theme like animals. So how does, how do you guys as artists, so when do you say this is a good story? This is how we work. Um, this is how we think 
in our world, you know, we, 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 we make decisions. What is important? When do you know what, what to put on stage? Uh, Karen, I think, mostly uh, invents uh, the, the initial uh, idea, the initial, st uh, and, and, the, and then she spends a lot of time uh, working out the story, the plot, uh, uh, and that takes a long time. So, uh, uh, and, then, and, so and, then then finally, and then finally, she lets me uh, uh, perhaps read the play. And that's when the fireworks start uh, between us because uh, we, we usually at, at 3 a.m. We're, we're talking about, uh, you know, hey, wait a minute. Uh, you're not going to do that, are you? You know, in the, middle, <laughs> in the middle of that scene, you know, and, and so we start uh, arguing, you know, from then on. And, and uh, that, that's one of the things that made uh, the Klemper such an incredible uh, experience because we took the diaries and we had to, if you know the diaries, they're, they're, they're the, the, I think the most incredible diaries of the 20th century, they, it's like war, uh, uh, war and peace, uh, you know, uh, because it has so many stories that you want to keep, and you can't. And if it hadn't been, uh, if I hadn't been working with Karen, uh, you know, she would have uh, allowed, she would not have allowed me, she didn't allow me, <laughs> actually, to, to uh, keep some of the stories that I wanted which I thought were brilliant. They were brilliant, they but were you brilliant. can't you can't keep everything. You have to know how to edit so that you really uh, keep the power of uh, what you're trying to do. So I can be a little so. bit specific about certain plays. I read a tremendous amount. I'm I'm a I was trained not to write plays but to read plays. Uh, my earliest uh, loves were Yeats and Augusta Gregory and that that combination, two people who made a theater that changed the life of Ireland, uh, quite literally, right? <clears throat> um, two poet, a poet and uh, a woman who, who became a playwright at the age of 50 and wrote 50 plays before she died. So anyway, I grew up reading and I, I'm a reader, I'm a great reader and I, I read a lot and I research a lot. So every play has enormous amount of research before I start to write it. Uh, with the Klemper, for instance, I was researching something else and I read the Klemper diaries and a little voice came into my head and said, why don't you do something nice for George, show him these diaries and suggest <laughs> that we make a one man show out of two volumes out of 600 pages of, of diary, right? And so we set about for several years editing this diary and we did not want to change a single word of the Klemper. He's a brilliant writer and editing his diaries was also a great uh, writing workshop for me. Uh, so we, we edited and edited and edited uh, down to two different one man shows, which we toured for George toured for four years in Europe. Um, so that was one, uh, one thing. Um, then, you know, uh, uh, um, just say Troy Two, for instance, uh, the new the newest play. I was reading Euripides uh, when the pandemic started because he's my favorite of the Greek playwrights. Although I love all the Greek playwrights and I read them and teach them also obsessively, um, and I'm very interested in theater as healing, as were the Greeks, and theater as a way of increasing democracy, as were the Greeks, and theater as a way of dealing with trauma. Uh, Euripides is the angriest and the most pacifist of the three playwrights. And I was reading the Trojan women kind of over and over again. <laughs> and, um, and then the idea of Troy too, T-O-O, -O, Troy also came into my mind as the city, as our city went into the heightened, the April uh, height of the pandemic uh, when it was very frightening and um, yeah, very frightening. And then, of course, on top of that came Black Lives Matter and and the climate crisis. I teach environmental justice as well as theater. And I'm, I'm uh, since uh, since the play Extreme Weather, I've been sort of known in that world as a, as an environmental writer. Um, uh, so uh, so you know you you're 
you're reading and then something clicks, something, something about now, something personal, but also historical. And those three things come together, what, you, what you've studied, what you've read, what you love, uh, what is happening in the world, and then some personal connection. And when those three things come together, then I have a story. Then I, then I begin to invent the story. You don't have, it's, the story doesn't fall into your head. It's, it's trial and error. Um, uh, writing is rewriting, and I do a tremendous amount of rewriting, usually. Sometimes things come perfectly. But. How long does it take from idea, first draft, finish draft? So how long do you work? It's totally play? different with every play. It's completely different with every play. I mean, in a way, we're always working because once I show the script to George and he says, I don't understand this at all, what's going on here? <laughs> and, then, and then we work our way into it. I mean, he comes from, I come from within it and he comes from outside it. And at a certain point we meet where we're both working with something that's outside of both of us, which is the creation of the, of the, of the actual production. Um, I'm so, so, so fortunate in, in my collaborations and especially the closest one is with George and some of the others I've mentioned. Um, and there are others that I could, but I, I, uh, I am uh, extraordinarily fortunate as a playwright to have people who, Beatrice Schiller, who takes the photographs of all of our plays, another great collaborator who just comes in, you never speak to her, she takes the photos and she gets every moment you know, that you want. Kristen Clifford, uh, uh, who worked with, was a student of mine at NYU and has been in a number of our, our plays. Najla Saeed, I mean, there, there are uh, people who come and, and go and Tommy, Tommy J. Moore and Emily, uh, Emily Daly, who were just in Other Than We, are people we will work with again, uh, that we did the Zoom production with them. So we try to make a commitment uh, to uh, our collaborators and and the the longer you work with people, the more they put in. You know, the more you so uh, what become what it starts is a very private, uh, really nonverbal moment when something moves in me that can be a play, then becomes over over time and sometimes it takes two years sometimes it takes three years sometimes it takes lesser time um, than that hmm. we have many um, many listeners also their students uh, writers actors directors but also writers um, from your really ex big experience can tell us something where you feel this worked well and this did not work well what do you do you have a little do you have, do you know something new, um, or is it new plays, every time? What worked well and what doesn't work well? I don't, I'm not sure what you're asking. Um, in, your, in your work, we say, yes, the audience got it. I mean, I understand from you that you said, you know, the, this is actually, they do understand and they yeah. feel something yeah. and they make connections in their minds, like in a good brush of play, but, but still, we all have works. <laughs> some, say, this was more that was. So it's good to know what, what, what did you, you know, from, from your experience? Are there advice you can give where people say, yeah, I think, you know, this is now a time where theater, in the political sense, was a clear message somehow, but still broad enough to capture the mystery of the universe. But what, what is it, think about this when you do this, when you start out. What do I, what? I'm sorry. Think about something like this. That's, you know, something we learned or what we... Well, uh, I mean, I, I try to think about what needs to be written about now. <laughs> you know, where at this very moment, for to use Troy too as an example, just because it's it, it's in my mind, we want to put it, we want to make it alive and also YouTube and animated, some kind of multimedia uh, production because theater right now, as you know, is difficult to do inside a theater space. Um, uh, so, um, uh, you know, one, one wanted to write about, you know, in, in this case, the climate crisis, the pandemic and Black Lives Matter and how they come together in this moment when our uh, Troy too, our, our, our uh, city state, our police, our, our demos are, is threatened, is threatened. Um, it's threatened from within, as it turns out, <laughs> you know, not, not from without, where the 
most powerful country in the history of the world, right? Nobody's gonna, you know, take us out. We can, we're gonna take ourselves out. Um, and, and this is the moment that we're in. Uh, and I think both, uh, uh, also uh, uh, other than we, both those plays are really aware of that, that, that this is a dangerous moment. We need a leap of consciousness. Uh, and that leap of consciousness is we are sentient creatures on a sentient planet. <laughs> and we are not here to control, we're not here to dominate. We're here to protect, to support, mm -hmm. to lift up, to nurture, to care for this fragile planet and the fragile beings, all of us fragile now. And the pandemic has shown us that. And of course, there will be more pandemics if we don't uh, address the way we are rampaging through nature. Right, mm -hmm. it's not just this this pandemic. There will be more, as Noam Chomsky said recently. This one is highly contagious, but not highly lethal. Although it's killing way too many people in this country, right? But we could get a highly contagious and highly lethal next virus, next iteration of this. And everybody's saying this. I mean, every health infectious disease person, and I'm, I, you know, I kind of obsessively read and follow. Um, the news of the day, and the news of the day right now is 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 infectious disease news, uh, among other uh, things. Um, you know, so so uh, one has to try to make a piece of work that will speak to what's needed now, and also what's where we could go, you know, how we can transform ourselves, not the bickering of the so much of the American theater, bicker, 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 bicker. No, 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 no. People fight in my plays, obviously. But, but, the, but the, the thrust is towards, towards transformation, towards change, uh, towards a deepening understanding of a, of a fragile place in a, in a fragile universe. Uh, um. Very well said. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, the, the need for a real transformation uh, uh, emotionally and intellectually towards a living uh, planet, towards the relationship that we have, that we are a part of, not that we are separate or better or anything like that at all. And we have to accept that. Uh, Mutual reciprocity, that's what we need. And the, the other thing I would say too is beauty um, of language. I mean, I'm, I'm a great, I love language um, and I love acting. And I find nothing more beautiful when, than when a beautiful actor, a physical actor, an actor who's been, George is a classically trained Shakespeare actor from Rada, no less. Other, you know, aside from his political training, he has, as I do, we have very classical theater trainings. And if we're asking for advice uh, for young people, I would say both, you know, yeah. you have to read the classics and read and reread. You have to find what you love and read and reread what you love, not just once, but you carry these things with you forever. You, you drop more deeply into each time you read a play that you love. Each time I read The mm -hmm. Trojan Women, for instance, I discover, oh my God, I never saw that. You know, I, it becomes more part of me and I carry these plays through my life. So as I change, I come back to the great liter liter literature that I love and I find new things in it. So the classical tradition George with Shakespeare, he's the, I'm not about Shakespeare the way I am about the Greeks, and we go back and forth with this. He's classically trained, but he's also from the avant-garde. He's also a movement person, a dance person, um, from the Judson Poets Theater, which we haven't mentioned yet, and Theater for the New City, which he co-founded. Um, uh, so the, these, two, these two seemingly disparate traditions, the classical tradition and the avant-garde tradition, political tradition, uh, actually go together. And I think that's true in 
even, you know, any, any playwright, Genet, a playwright I love very much, uh, you know, has those two, <laughs> the classical and the, and the uh, political uh, vision, you know. So that that would be my advice is is read <laughs> and the other and the other advice uh, <clears throat> I would have is find somebody who's doing work that you love and throw yourself at their feet as we did you know as I did with the open theater as George did yeah. you know apprentice uh, as yes. George did with the living theater and then I did also with the living theater don't become them don't join them apprentice and then you go and do your own work yeah and. Uh, as Judith said, Judith Molina said to me once, you know, people either stay as your acolytes or they become your equals and your friends and your, you know, artistic friends. And you do that by kind of giving yourself to whether it's uh, the Abbey Theater in my imagination, Yates and Augusta Gregory, or the Living Theater, actually rehearsing with them and doing you know all kinds of things with them and then you become your own your your own thing which is something unlike what your mentors did but it, it totally informed by them so you transform yourself <laughs> actually but you can't transform yourself unless you love the giving over to something, someone outside of yourself, ideas bigger than you. And that's true in the political world and it's true in the climate as we try to love the world, love the world more than we've ever loved the world in order to save the world, right? You, the giving of yourself over to something larger than you are changes you and allows you to do the next work, become the new again, new, new enough to do something new. Yeah. I mean, for, for years, you know, I, I was uh, an acolyte of different uh, theater, uh, uh, famous people like uh, Andre Gregory, uh, Jerome Robbins, Elia uh, uh, Kazan. I worked with all those people and each one taught me something and it was a wonderful experience, but, you know, I was never satisfied because they never put together uh, movement and uh, ideas and they didn't know how to do that because they didn't have a real appreciation of language and poetry and I was mad about poetry and I was always looking for a more poetic theater somewhere that was also maybe political uh, you know and of course that's the <laughs> one of the hardest things to find uh, uh, you know, and it was a sheer moment when I had almost given up uh, finding such a thing. Uh, uh, when uh, Judith Molina walked in with Karen and her new play, and it was uh, Judith's return to America, and she wanted to have uh, two two American actors do this. Uh, play, which where two people play six roles. They play in, themselves in and their parents as yeah, and lovers. Their parents and so their it's, lovers, it's, and it, it's it's amazing, just amazing a piece. And I, right away when I start to read it, I said, "What? What? Wait a minute! What is this?" And I was so uh, thrilled to find this imagist uh, and also very physical theater. Uh, uh, that that uh, used language to put you an, into a situation right away, just to leap into the situation with the language, and it, it was uh, it was amazing. And for so. me, the thrill how we fell in love. The, for me, the thrill of watching this actor physicalize my language. <laughs> so there is there there is a lot of nature in us. There's always a lot of nature in all of my plays. Um, but there there is a horse scene in which George as the character actually became this horse. And there's another scene that takes place underwater in the sea with the sea creatures swimming around a, a young boy. It's his memory, which which George also did. It's it's two actors who play themselves and their parents as lovers. And the, it's uh, ethnically con, con, uh, cri, uh, 
conflict with it in each each pair. Um, and he also plays uh, uh, his mother, <laughs> and mm -hmm. he plays. Um, you know, so there, there's a lot of gender switching. The, the female actor plays her father, beating, beating her mother, as a matter of fact. Um, he plays his mother in a very narcissistic uh, scene where he dresses in a, he dressed in this long slinky dress and put on makeup and, um, uh, yeah. So, so these, these, and Judith staged this play on a, on a set that was uh, 60 feet long, 30 feet high and two feet wide. So the actors were always on an edge <laughs> as they were running up and down and doing all these, these uh, things. Um, yeah. 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 So it's that mixture of the physical and the, and the, and the poetic and the intellectual, um, the idea, because a play without an idea is really a bore also, or many ideas for that matter. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned sometimes who, who in the contemporary American theater, who, who, who do you look up to? Who do you connect to? Where do you feel you said clearly in a way also, you know, we don't get this, the support we should, that we are being censored, economical censorship, the risk taking isn't there. They also, it's not the subsidies like in Europe, but um, so where do you fit in in this scene? I, do, do you have context to a Broadway world, to the non-profit, which auction art profit? How does it all work for such a small company? And um, and uh, how do you feel? It doesn't, it doesn't work. It's impossible. It's impossible. Um, uh, I, I, as I said, it works because we have people who we work with who love our work, who we love. And we just do it, you know. Um, and now with Troy too, Avra in... in um, uh, 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 Athens, in Cyprus, in Greece, um, will have an international collaboration. Yetin Nezerich, um, who's a wonderful playwright in Kosovo, where we rehearsed uh, Another Life at, at the National Theater when Yetin was the um, uh, artistic, uh, director. artistic director of the National Theater. So there's a lot of international, Naomi Wallace is a dear friend of mine, a uh, great playwright. Um, we support each other's work. Um, she's mainly based in England, but she's an American. Um, Kathy Chalfant is, you know, my great collaborator with George. Uh, so that, yes, uh, there are other people's theaters um, who, you know, I admire. Yet and Naomi have in contact, and uh, our poetic, our language writers and idea writers and political writers, both, both those two. Um, I'm just talking about close, close friends at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's still not not easy to survive and to make work. So it's quite you're quite uh, successful as a people <laughs> who kept doing it and who are a role model. I think you know say yeah, well they did it. You know Karen and George. <laughs> yeah. it, uh, well, you know this this one always says just keep going. I'm much more hysterical. He's I I will I will give up, but he will not give up, and and I think that's. Find someone or someone's who you can work with who really, whose work you love, uh, who you admire as a human being. Um, and this is true of all the people we work with. They are incredible uh, artists and thinkers, and and uh, and um, we sustain we sustain each other in this funny little bumpy way that we're going to do. Uh, Blue Valiant on a farm um, of a lovely woman who does wonderful theater, whose name is Tanis. It's it's um, Farm Arts Collective, and that came to us because of Sally uh, Parsons, our our costume designer, who knows Tanis, and and Tanis knows my work, and I know her work. So this is again another very different work, very but work that we admire and and want to support. And now she will give us her let us work on her farm, where she also does her her performances. Um, again, Avra found me uh, because she asked around in Europe uh, if there were any American playwrights and a couple of people uh, who knew my book, um, Plays in Time, which was published by Intellect, which is an English publisher, uh, suggested me. So, so there's a kind of international web of, of uh, artists who uh, whose work we, ad we admire. We did, when we took Extreme Weather to Paris, 
we we co-produced it with with a Swiss um, French uh, company and worked with French and and Swiss French actors in English and in French, um, and that was another wonderful international collaboration. Uh, so there are people around the world <laughs> who, who we work with and people in New York uh, who we work with. Um, Katie Davis, who teaches at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, at, at Oklahoma, it's not, it's not the University, but it's a, it's a liberal arts college in Oklahoma, uh, who sent us a wonderful young woman, uh, Emma Rose Krauss, who was in uh, Extreme Weather. Um, and, and she, Katie, did a version of Extreme Weather in Oklahoma, um, and she's a great friend of our work. I mean, they're, they're you know, I could go on and on, but, um, you know, these, these, these uh, connections are very precious. Nina Camberos, who publishes uh, uh, Laertes books and publishes the acting editions of my plays and Yetim's plays and uh, will publish an anthology that contains our work and other people's work. She uh, is finding amazing playwrights from around the world. I'm, at this point, I'm the only American playwright in her, on her list. Um, but wonderful, wonderful playwrights from everywhere else. <laughs> and uh, so there's an international um, uh, mm -hmm. connections that, that feel very real and, and perhaps are very good at this time when this country is so isolated from the rest of the world, right? Uh, yeah. In policy, we're, we're against the World Health Organization. We're pulling out of the Paris Climate Agreement today, as a matter of fact. Um, uh, and yet we as artists are reaching out uh, around the world to other artists and, and having more and more of international collaborations. Hmm. Uh, George, if I may ask, how, how old were you as a boy when you fled Nazi Germany with your family? Six. That, I, was six I was six when, when <laughs> my brother and I left. Maybe tell us about the moment and then also does that inform you? Is that the reason why you do theater or uh, is that dependent uh, well, of I think it informs everything that I do. Uh, my parents were both dancers. They had a company in uh, Berlin and they toured around Germany uh, in the 20s. And uh, then they finally got a bad review in, in the Nazi press. And my mother said, you know what, I think it's time to go. Uh, and my father didn't want to go because he said, oh, well, but, but, but uh, we're in the culture. They're not going to bother me because he was Russian Jewish. And uh, my mother said, oh, no, oh, no, not this time. <laughs> this is different. And, and uh, you know, so uh, they came to America first to see if they could make a living. And then they sent for us finally uh, uh, in 38 and 39, we got out in 39. Uh, so yes, uh, that experience there definitely uh, stayed with me forever. And when I, when I was in high school, uh, the McCarthy hearings just shocked me out of my mind. I couldn't believe that such a thing was possible in America, uh, that uh, this one character uh, suddenly had, uh, you know, taken over the, seemed to take over the, the Congress and the Senate and so on and so forth in this obviously uh, uh, really horrible way that he was, uh, you know, uh, getting people uh, to commit suicide and, and, and you know, uh, lose their jobs and so on and so forth. And I just thought, my God, it can happen here, uh, you know, and one thing and another. And then I was, uh, uh, after I was in Judson, I, I, you know, Judson was just pure poetry and, and a liberation for me because there suddenly I could put the language together with uh, a movement and uh, the style of those plays which were very free and open. Um, and uh, then, you know, I decided, well, you know, let's start a theater of our own. 
uh, and stop complaining. Uh, you know, let's just do do what we want. And, and of course, in the beginning, you know, there was so many poets and so many playwrights, so many people who had something important to say. Everybody wanted to had something important to say. And that we came from that tradition, both of us. We worked with those people. We were attracted to those people. They made our lives uh, meaningful and suddenly uh, we, we had uh, a direction. Uh, but it didn't come, you know, like, uh, it wasn't like one door opened and it was, we were in. It took a, a number of experiences. Uh, I mean, with uh, 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 Jerome Robbins, for instance, and so on, who wanted to form a, a poetic dance theater. And I thought, oh, this is it. I finally found the person that I want to work with forever and be in his company, you know. And then it turned out he didn't have an ear for language. And so, you know, it the whole thing collapsed. And that really <laughs> upset me because that was the hope that I had had to find this theater where I could make a synthesis, you know, of two things that would make theater more meaningful, more exciting. Uh, and, uh, you know, I want to use both what my, I, I got from my parents in the way of movement and, and dance and, and also, you know, what I, what I loved about the same year I was in the in the Broadway show, I went back to Piscotters and 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 was in uh, played Bottom in Midsummer Night's Dream, and I <laughs> language, <laughs> you know. And, and you know when we, you know, were, when so we... that was it. I had to put the two things together mm -hmm. and find somebody uh, mm -hmm. who could do it. And if I didn't, couldn't, if I couldn't find somebody, you know, finally it was sheer desperation. Let's do it ourselves, you know. And you were the early zoo story, right? By Olby and... Uh... Oh, well, that was another great experience because of it. it was Beckett. And and I got to play it back to back in the same night, uh, you know, for six months. Craps Last Tape. Craps Last story. Tape and the zoo story, which is really, it was incredible. Yeah, so Beckett has been also a big influence. Oh, Beckett me. is, uh, But you I know, just my, wanted to talk about economics yeah. for a minute, because when we start, yeah. and it'll be interesting to see what happens to the city post-pandemic. When we started out, you didn't need money to do theater, and nobody thought about money. So the open theater wasn't thinking about money. Then they started to get grants, and then they disbanded right, right, right at that moment. But my first play, A Lament for Three Women, was done with with uh, open theater actors uh, who Joe put me in touch with, and we did it in Sibylla, Sibylla Haynes' Soho Loft. At that time, Soho was not Soho as it became. It was a grungy place where artists had big lofts, and we did it in natural light so that it started at it ended at just as the sun set into the river and so that lighting that came through the window gave this incredible lighting effect for the for the play <clears throat> and so uh, money was not an issue and indeed we remained a poor theater as Wachowski would or Peter Schumann another friend of ours bread and puppet um, we we've all remained uh, poor and, and there's a virtue to that. And somebody was talking today about all the money that was spent on this election, much of it just thrown away, you know, and, um, you know, it didn't produce the results that the money, especially people thought it would produce. Um, too much money is, is not so good for art. Money for actors, money for, money for people to live on. We have always paid not enough, but we always pay the people we work with. We never expect anybody to work with us for free, ever. Um, that is a mark of, of respect for the artist, but we never spend a lot of money on productions, never. And because Sally Ann Parsons owns a major costume shop, she can make all of her costumes and she does. And she she's the president of our board, et cetera. So she she contributes to the theater with, with her her Broadway, the Broadway work that she does. But but for you know the idea of, of not wasting money, but investing in 
in language and in, in people and in idea and mm -hmm. emotion. You know, we don't need all this fancy stuff on the stage. It gets, it, it obscures, mm -hmm. you know. Yes. That said, of course, give us money. We'd love to have yeah. more money. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, I think we could stay so much longer, uh, or just with each one of you alone. But I think it was a good, it was wonderful to have you both together. So, so at the moment, um, what inspires you? What do you what, what do you read, or what do you listen to, what do you watch? Or, you know, uh, so be honest. We really want to know. Uh, you know, we had a Jay. Uh, a Jay here from about what inspires us this whole time. You want something yeah. else? We've been reading out loud since the pandemic started at night. So we've so read- you sit in the evening, you sit on two chairs in your living room and you yeah, read to each other. Yeah, we sit in a chair in the living room and we read. Um, we started with Camus, we read The Plague and the Stranger, rereading. Re re then I introduced George to a wonderful, uh, to Ursula. You read aloud? You read aloud no, or read you read aloud. in silence? We read aloud. We read aloud. Uh, we read. Yes, read we aloud. Read aloud. We read out loud. Oh, it's much better. Then we read two or so. It's right. an hour or how long is a session when Karen and George however, read to However each other. long we feel like reading. We, we'll stop and talk or we'll, you know, yeah. however long. Um, we read, so we read two Camus, then we read uh, Ursula Le Guin, um, uh, um, her two great novels, The Dispossessed, and what's the other one, The Left, left Side of Dan, da I have, I can yeah. pull it off my shelf, but the great ice story, both, both fantastic novels, she's a, she's a, she's somebody I devoured all of her The work. Left Hand of Darkness. Left Hand of Darkness. I devoured all of her work uh, as I was uh, preparing to write Other Than We, and as I also read all of Noam Chomsky's linguistics, which I've been reading on and off since the 70s when I first discovered Noam, but he, he had published several new books. Uh, so, you know, one is inspired by, you know, by, by what one reads. Right now we're reading Hardy, we read Jude and we're reading Tess. Um, but also I've been reading obsessively about health and prevention everything I could get my hand on, hands on about the pandemic, how it started, um, what the virus is, and also about prevention, which, you know, there hasn't been enough talk about. Um, vitamin D, vit the vit building up your own immune system, because this is, you know, there's no focus on prevention in Western medicine, which is criminal. Um, you know, they go in and they nuke you, they nuke you better than anyone, you know, they're really good at nuking, but they're not good at prevention. And then they're not good at healing after they've nuked you. So after they've nuked you, you have to heal yourself, right? So this, this, and of course we, people don't eat well in this country. Um, you know, I'm, I, we're lucky to live, I'm a member of the Park Slope Food co so we eat very well, we eat organic food. Um, but most people don't have that luxury. It's too expensive, you know, that blah, blah, blah. Um, so, you know, what am I reading? And then I love to teach Baldwin, uh, Blues for Mr. Charlie. I'm teaching uh, um, theater and justice at John Jay College. So uh, of course I'm rereading Blues for Mr. Charlie for the 50th time as I teach it. <laughs> and I do a lot of rereading. Um, I, uh, Baldwin is one of my favorite writers. Um, uh, so, uh, Yes. We read Moby Dick out loud. Yeah, we read Moby Dick out loud That's before, fantastic. We, before we went to the Paris uh, climate conference with it, with the yeah. extreme weather, we read Moby Dick out loud. Um, right. Yeah. About the superficial world, right? What he calls when you walk on, <laughs> when you walk on the earth, the superficial, <laughs> the ocean. Official world. Yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah. Incredible. Yeah. And, and music wise, or listen to your films, or. Uh, I mean, you know, well, we haven't been watching so many films uh, except what we, we did watch Alec, Alex Gibney's um, documentary, um, totally, totally Under Control about the pandemic, the one that just came out, um, which is really worth seeing. It's about the Chicago it's, 7? No, no, we watched no? the Chicago 7 too. We yeah. watched Alan Sorkin's new new film, The Chicago Seven, and then we watched Alex Gibney's yeah. Totally Under Control. Those are the last two films. Yeah. And then Dr. Strangelove was on Channel 13 a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> we watched that again, <laughs> once again. Um, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. 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 So this is good. So, you know, it's a good reminder, you guys, to say, you know, react uh, as every good actor, react to the 
scene you're in, you know, so if you're a writer, you know, see what's happening around you, but look back over thousands of years, have a dialogue with the classics, but create something new that could yeah, be. And, and also be look different. outside of this country, because of course, you know, one of the pleasures that, I, that I've had as a playwright, because I have written about the invasions of Iraq, <laughs> and, and I have been invited a number of times to the theater festival in Egypt, is to meet people from the Middle East, uh, uh, and to meet refugees when I wrote uh, The Beekeeper's Daughter, which is about a Bosnian refugee, I met lots of Bosnian refugees, some of whom became very close friends, lifelong heart friends. Um, this country does things to other countries, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and, and you know, we we both of us grew up in the Vietnam War, which was you know a mm -hmm. shock and a and a terror and a nightmare daily. Mm -hmm. And then the assassinations, um, and you know now we are you know we're still in that uh, moment um, mm -hmm. where we're hurting other people. And and if you reach out to the people who we've hurt, you you find extraordinary human beings and extraordinary stories and your world uh, becomes larger and and uh, and people need to know that Americans care. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And we to reach out, we have to also read the stories from themselves, from the immigrants, from people from Africa, Asia, Australia, oh, anywhere yes. where they listen to yes. the story and combine it. Yes. So to talking about hurting others or not and the uncertainty, uh, maybe we ask uh, Andy, is there any update? Uh, because okay. we have been talking now. Andy Lara, is there any update? Uh, you, you didn't interrupt us, so uh, give us a little idea before we close it down. Absolutely, just a small update from about 10 minutes ago. So they have not officially called Wisconsin. However, 99% of the votes are now in and Biden is in the lead by 20,000 votes. So they're only waiting on about 300 left in a small county, but the Trump campaign has already said that they're going to um, request an immediate recount. Okay. So, so it looks as if Biden is have a lucky is as having a lucky star constellation of the stars at the moment. So Beth Malone, who's a marvelous actress, who was in um, uh, Home. What is the what is the name? Other of than we. No, no, she was. She just did a reading with of us with Other Than We, but she's known oh. for a Broadway show, and the name I is totally flown out of. Uh, oh, but it's very famous, and I know it. Forgive me. Anyway. Uh, Beth, uh, who we just got to work with because of the pandemic, because we could never have afforded her without the pandemic. But she worked yeah. on other, the, the Zoom of Other Than We, and we had a great time. She was part of uh, Flip Wisconsin, which was a very grassroots organization to Flip Wisconsin, which I joined with her <laughs> um, and donated to. It's one of the, you know, um, and I'm glad to see it's working and we're flipping Wisconsin because okay. I, I also went to the University of Wisconsin. So I know, I know. Yeah. So it's just the fact, you know, what we do and even in theater, you know, I often think of it of a homeopathic pill that is chosen, you know, by the artist doctors, you know, to almost <laughs> invisible, but it is inserted and perhaps, yeah. you know, is something it does and by observing by looking by creating uh, um, um publics and sit around in a circle you know we also change but by the very 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 fact of it we're going to continue our talks tomorrow maybe we know more tomorrow we know who the president <laughs> is or not uh, uh, or not on friday tomorrow we have simon um, uh, from uh, from the great CEC Arts Link. He took over from the, the legendary Fritzy Brown and he has um, many new uh, artists. He brings to the country, does exactly what you guys say. We need to be in dialogue. We need to be together. Something we at the Seagull also try very much to do. And, yes, and, and so and now also he had, does this Zoom talk. Also one where we were interested in the idea of radical hosting, hosting people, what you also said. you know. So artists are working on that that will be of interest in this kind of socially, politically engaged art, what we have. Then we have the great Susan Feldman by the end of the week on Friday. She will talk about St. Anne and you know how she got there, what is happening there now, what is going through her mind. Uh, now finally she has a great space, open not so long ago, and now it's well, and then, you know, like, it costs less to build than as far as we know PS1 or PS community, person, you know, so uh, incredible. Um, so what is happening and so, um, thank you all for listening. Thanks to HowlRound for having us back. And uh, what, a, what an incredible time 
Uh, this is a historic day, so you guys are part of it. Uh, Andy, thank you for giving us an update as a newscaster, uh, as a new career for you. And uh, to our listeners, really, um, thank you for uh, spending time with us. And it's important to listen what these artists say. say. Engage with history, engage with the moment, listen to people, engage with people, make up your own ideas, your own company, which also means make up your own mind, you know, engage, don't, don't uh, just follow others. But if you do follow them as a follow up, but then, you know, you also transform it and you uh, create something that makes, gives meaning to you and then others, because new generations will have to put everything together new. But Karen and George did a fantastic work, I think, in their lives. Uh, their engagement with theater and the arts has been profound. It has been influential. Um, it stands up as uh, one of the many possibilities of theater. Hans T. Lehmann says theater is a house. It has many rooms. And in one of the rooms, Karen and George live. There's a great contribution they made with the, also the three collaborative companies. So this is something to really uh, take serious. And it's important. And it's a great contribution towards civilization and towards you know, the advancement of the idea of mankind and towards justice and freedom. So um, thank you, you know, and congratulations on what you what you did. And it's important for us to hear it, to hear it again. You all know it. But um, in these times uh, where things are on the line, as we see now, where votes do count, as in the Camus play we did yesterday, with other Astorias and today. Um, so it does matter in the political. But how to do it? How, what does work on it? It's great questions. And we have now even better questions. We don't give really answers or explanation, but we explore. So this was a great Great moment. Thank you all. And I hope you will join us again this week. Stay safe. And uh, thank, thank you so you. much, Frank. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Andy. Really. Frank. It's a big it's honor having you. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Bye bye. And thanks, Thea and Vijay. Bye bye.